All right, we are right at the start time, two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So we'll go ahead and begin. First off, good afternoon. I'm Jason Thomas, project engineer at America Makes and your host today, uh, America Makes TRX webinar series. A little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speaker. As America Makes continues its mission to expand and accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, this medium called the America Makes Technical Review and Exchange webinar series was created. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturing and 3D printing community to come together and share knowledge and experience with a broader community. If you or your team are interested in presenting during the TRX webinar series, there will be a link to complete the request form at the end of our series today, or you can contact the American Makes TRX webinar series administrator, Jason Thomas, directly. A few important notes before we kick off the series. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answer session. If during the presentation you do have a question, please submit it in the Q&A space on your WebEx screen, and we, I'll ask it during the Q&A session. Uh, I will do my best to get to all of the questions. Today's webinar is on binder jetting additive manufacturing ceramic materials. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Chow Ma, PhD from Texas A&M University. Ma received his bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University in 2010 his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2012, and his PhD degree from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2015, all in mechanical engineering. He was a senior mechanical engineer at, at Symer, an ASML company from 2015 to 2016. He is currently an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. His te teaching interests are manufacturing processes and product design. His research interests include additive manufacturing, laser manufacturing, and metal matrix nanocomposites. He has published more than 50 peer-reviewed papers in these areas. His teaching, research, and service have been recognized by multiple awards, such as the Best Paper Award of Manufacturing Division at the ASEE Annual Conference and Exposition, the Outstanding Paper Award at the International Conference on Micromanufacturing, and the Best Organizer of Symposium and Session Award at the ASME International Manufacturing Science and Engineering Conference. Chow, I will now turn it over to you and your team. Thanks a lot, Jason, for the nice introduction. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to present uh, our work to such a broad uh, audience. And I don't have a chance, I didn't have a chance to see you guys during this special time. I, I'm glad we had this opportunity. I do see a few, uh, quite a few familiar names. And I would like to uh, start this uh, presentation by the, somehow I cannot move my slide. I'm sorry, somehow I cannot. Yeah, move my slides. Maybe I can stop sharing and uh, share it again. That's what I was going to recommend. Okay. Now, now it's working. Yeah, thanks for uh, waiting for me. And uh, I will start this presentation by uh, this uh, ceramic additive manufacturing market projection. Uh, this uh, uh, market projection was over uh, a little bit more than a decade, right? So from uh, 2017 to uh, 2028, right? And you can see this a uh, large uh, exponential growth uh, projected and this covers many areas of uh, ceramic additive manufacturing, right? from low cost hardware to high end hardware, from traditional uh, materials and parts to uh, technical materials and parts. Right? So why do people uh, believe uh, in such a strong uh, market in ceramic additive manufacturing? I think it's because of the unique uh, material properties of ceramic materials. Right? Uh, ceramic material have very uh, good material properties, for example, high hardness, uh, very good resistance to wear, heat, and chemicals, and also very good uh, biocompatibility, right? That's why they are used uh, in very 
uh, critical applications where we have a strict requirement or harsh environment. For example, a uh, uh, joint uh, process in the healthcare industry and uh, air, air, aircraft engines in the aerospace industry, like uh, plastic armors in the defense industry, uh, chemical resistant impellers, for example, in oil and the gas industry, and heat exchangers in the energy industry. And these are all uh, critical applications. Uh, however, uh, ceramic material has a poor manufacturer ability. So especially for traditional uh, manufacturing method, and they have uh, drawbacks associated uh, with them. For example, uh, limited geometric freedom and the long production time and the high manufacturing uh, cost. And uh, we all know that uh, additive manufacturing could resolve uh, these uh, uh, drawbacks. Uh, but we have like uh, uh, a lot of uh, additive manufacturing processes to choose from. Uh, the reason why we liked uh, binder jetting, we chose binder jetting, is because of its uh, unique advantages, right? So here I'm giving an overview of uh, its process, right? We start with uh, powder preparation on the left, and uh, after that we do printing. And in the printing process, basically we use a print head to jet some binder to uh, uh, bond the uh, loose powders in the powder bed. And then we obtain a, a green part layer by layer, right? After that, we can do a uh, debinding to get rid of the binder and do and then sintering to densify uh, the part, right? So that's the uh, generic uh, process chain of binder jetting. Of course, you can do some uh, uh, other special uh, post-processing if you want, like uh, isostatic pricing and the infiltration. And, uh, uh, because of uh, its unique process, it has certain uh, advantages over other additive manufacturing processes. Uh, for example, we all know that additive manufacturing has uh, this advantage of a geometric freedom, but uh, a binder jetting actually offers more. Uh, because of the loose powder bed can support, uh, can support overhang structures, and we can make uh, internal channels easily with binder jetting and not easily with other uh, processes. And also it has a very large uh, dimensional freedom, especially uh, for ceramics. And for ceramics, uh, for other techniques, usually we need to uh, introduce a lot of binder. Uh, usually they are like a polymer based and uh, it's very hard to debind. And you have a limitation on the part size. And uh, for example, for some uh, processes, you can only make a five millimeter part, right? So not very good uh, for uh, large uh, part applications, right? So, you, but the binder jetting can do the binding uh, easily. So we can um, use it to make a large part. And also because it forms part using the binder, it has a uh, very good uh, material freedom. You can use it for almost uh, any kind of material. Uh, for example, uh, diamond is very hard to process with other uh, technique, but uh, we can do it with a uh, uh, binder jetting, right? And here uh, are the advantages and the reason why we chose binder jetting. And uh, in this slide, I want to show uh, the binder jetting capability we have at the Texas A&M. So we have uh, three printers uh, for now, and we have this uh, Innovant uh, Plus from X1. Uh, this printer allows for uh, dispensing ultra fine powder, and also it has a function uh, which we can use to uh, compact the powder bed. Later on, we'll show some work, recent work we done, uh, we have done with uh, this feature. And we also have this uh, MicroJet Come True uh, T10 uh, printer, and we have a agreement with the vendor. Uh, it allows us to uh, develop a customer custom binders. And we also have this uh, lab build printer based on Plan B uh, platform, and it allows us to modify the machine and make some uh, innovative machine designs. And uh, other capability we have uh, include uh, this uh, feedstock powder preparation. We can do granulation, we can blend the different powders, we can also coat, uh, make a coating on the powder particles. Later on, we'll talk about our work uh, along these lines. And uh, we can also do post-processing like a thermal treatment and also infiltration. And for characterization and measurement, we can do powder, powder bed and printed parts. We also did a lot of modeling work, uh, analytical modeling or numerical modeling. Uh, recently, we did a lot of work with uh, uh, discrete element method. And our research team uh, has uh, two uh, PIs, uh, Dr. CJ Pei and myself. 
and we uh, co-advise uh, seven PhD students from uh, three different departments, industrial and systems engineering, mechanical engineering, material science and engineering. So uh, quite a few of them are graduating. And if you are looking for any new employees, uh, please uh, let us know. And uh, uh, all of them are hardworking and smart. Uh, our research uh, is funded by NSF and uh, also uh, DOE actually through uh, Argonne National Lab and uh, also by the industry. And we have published more than 10 uh, peer-reviewed papers and one uh, patent application. And here is the outline of the uh, presentation uh, for the remaining uh, part. Uh, we uh, have developed four approaches uh, to improving density and the strength. Uh, we have this uh, multi-model powder and uh, coated powder, uh, granulated powder, and uh, lastly, uh, nano powder assisted by powder bed compaction. So the motivation of our work is really uh, from this uh, literature review we, we did uh, like uh, in the last uh, two or three years. We collect all the papers in the literature about the ceramic uh, binder jetting, and we summarize them uh, in terms of uh, their uh, special treatment. I suppose special treatment here means uh, uh, something extra in addition to uh, regular uh, powder feedstock and uh, sintering uh, post-processing route, right? For example, people can use isostatic pricing, people can do infiltration, people can use a slurry-based uh, feedstock, right? So if you don't do those kind of a special uh, like treatment, uh, you, can, you cannot achieve a very high density, right? And those uh, special treatment uh, are associated with uh, some uh, uh, drawbacks, for example, infiltration, right? So you, you have to introduce another material, right? And uh, it's, you, it's compromising the purity of the material. And uh, isostatic pricing, you are compromising the uh, like a geometric freedom, right? And uh, if you use a slurry feedstock, uh, first of all, it's not uh, commercially available, I mean the machine, and uh, also it's a lengthy uh, process, right? So our work is try to improve the density, right? Without those uh, special uh, treatment technique. And the first uh, method uh, we tried uh, is uh, to develop this uh, multi-model powder. So to increase the final density, I think a straightforward idea is to uh, increase the powder bed density, right? So that's the uh, starting point. And uh, uh, people have tried to mix uh, different uh, sized powders to let the small particles fill the gap among the large particles so that we can achieve a higher uh, powder bed density. But traditionally, uh, powders of different sizes were mixed uh, arbitrarily, right? So people choose uh, 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 mixing ratio or mixing fractions by their experience maybe. And uh, it's also involved a lot of trial and error. And our contribution is really to introduce this uh, linear uh, packing model to uh, binder jetting. And uh, as you can see, and he, this figure illustrate uh, a case where we mix uh, two kinds of powders and uh, a very fine powder and a coarse powder, right? And uh, on each end, right, left or the right, you have 100% of uh, the component powder, right? So on the left-hand side, you have 100% fine powder. On the right-hand side, you have 100% uh, uh, coarse powder. And uh, only at a certain ratio, you can achieve the uh, maximum uh, packing density. And uh, this model can predict where you can achieve the uh, maximum uh, packing density. And uh, basically, it's the uh, condition all the fine powders can fill the gaps of the uh, coarse powder. It's a uh, geometry-based uh, model. And we use this model uh, to uh, conduct a case study. So we uh, calculated the packing density of a mixture of three components. We call it the ternary mixture. Uh, we have a, a powder of 70 micron and powder of uh, 10 micron and powder of uh, 2 micron, right? And we com uh, computed this map to guide us uh, how to select the best uh, uh, condition, right? And uh, the color indicate the packing density we can achieve, right? 
So the warmer the color, the higher the density, right? So this kind of uh, yellowish color uh, is really give us the best uh, result, right? So you can see this uh, uh, red dot uh, is the optimal condition for this uh, uh, ternary mixture. And uh, so this uh, 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 ternary plot can also be used uh, to uh, predict uh, binary mixture as well, right? So if you are looking for binary mixture between 70 micron powder and two micron powder, you can look at the left edge and same thing for the right edge and the bottom edge, right? So you can have a, uh, information about the uh, binary mixture and the, the information about how to read this uh, chart is available in our recent uh, uh, publication. And this is the prediction, right? And we want to know uh, if, our, if the prediction from the model uh, is true. And we just uh, conduct some experimental measurement, right? We measure the type density because the type density is a, a very good uh, estimation for the fully packed uh, density, right? So you can see all the gray dots, our, uh, our experimental results. So we conduct a lot of experiments uh, by mixing uh, different powders, uh, both uh, binary on the edge and the ternary in the middle of the chart. And you can see the trend um, obtained from these uh, experimental results uh, match well with the uh, theoretical prediction. Uh, basically, in the middle, you have this uh, large uh, uh, density. And also for uh, uh, binary mixture, and you, you have a optimal point around uh, uh, each uh, uh, about 30% of the powder, right? So for each cases. And if we want to uh, quantify uh, the deviation uh, of the modeling from the experiments, then we can look at this chart. Uh, you can see uh, all the deviation is within uh, plus and minus uh, uh, ten percent, right? So which means that the, the model did a pretty good job in predicting the uh, packing density. Uh, so after validating the model, uh, we conduct uh, some experiment, some uh, spreading and printing experiment. Uh, basically, we measure the powder bed density. And also, after printing, we did some sintering. We measure the sinter density. And uh, we only focus on the kind of the best case scenario for each mixture, right? For the binary uh, mixture, three of them, we have this optimal condition. And for the ternary mixture, we also have this uh, turn, uh, uh, optimal condition. And that's what we uh, studied. And you can see uh, this uh, uh, powder bed density and the sinter density follow the same trend uh, of the model, the density, and the type density for the most part. And uh, only this, uh, 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 except for this uh, very fine mixture, which uh, uh, the flowability really uh, decreased the powder bed density. So, but overall, uh, this model can give us insight about how to mix powder to achieve a higher uh, uh, density. And uh, this slide shows uh, the experimental result of the microstructure. And you can see how the fine particles have filled the uh, gaps among the large particles. And uh, to have one step further, so we use the model, use the linear packing model uh, to compute some um, uh, result to serve as a, a mod, model a powder selection guide, right? And we have these uh, three chart. So first the chart is uh, uh, to use, it can be used uh, to determine if uh, mixing is effective or not. So uh, if you have a very fine powder and it has a low packing density, so in that case, uh, no matter how much uh, uh, fine powder you add to the coarse powder, you can you will always uh, decrease the packing density of the uh, coarse powder. In that case, uh, mixing is not effective; is uh, not worthy. Uh, so we use uh, this chart. We computed this chart, right? You have this uh, packing density ratio between the uh, fine powder to the coarse powder, and also you have this particle size ratio. And this one, uh, the, those two uh, parameters are everything you need to collect and obtain. And you can just use this chart uh, to uh, judge if you want to do mixing or not, right? So if your uh, point or your data falls uh, to the left of this uh, curve and you want to do uh, mixing, mixing can improve density. And uh, uh, 
uh, after make this uh, decision, so if we decided to do mixing uh, because it's uh, going to be effective, and we can use the second chart to predict the opti optimal uh, uh, mixing fraction, and uh, given uh, the uh, particle size ratio and the particle uh, packing, I mean, the powder packing density ratio. And uh, after that, you can also use the third chart to predict the maximum uh, achievable packing density, right? So you can use the third chart. Basically, this uh, this three chart are uh, uh, a toolbox uh, with uh, uh, powder selection uh, guidances. So we can we can use that in the future to uh, save us a trial and error effort. Uh, but this method, although it shows uh, we can increase the the density, but uh, the density uh, was not. Uh, largely improved. So the density of uh, the centered part is still lower than the fully packed density. And the, the reason is that uh, the centerability of the micro powder uh, was poor, right? So we were using uh, 70 micron, 10 micron, 2 micron, and this powder has a, a poor centerability. And that's why we developed the second method, uh, which is called a coated powder. And uh, we used a so-called uh, soil gel method, right? So we start with some organic material and uh, we uh, add uh, some aluminum ion in it. And in this case, uh, we are uh, trying to do an alumina coating, right? So we put alumin aluminum ion uh, in it and we form this uh, metal saturate uh, complex. And, uh, and then we apply heat to uh, uh, form a polyester, right? So it kind of like a polymerization process and uh, we have this uh, polymer uh, as a big chunk and uh, it contains aluminum ion, right? And uh, then you can burn it out, burn out the organic phase and you are left with this uh, uh, alumina, right, only. And uh, this uh, process uh, actually can give us amorphous alumina. Uh, later on, uh, we confirmed that with uh, like a TGA and a DSC study. Uh, and uh, if we uh, just do this process uh, alone, we get uh, some kind of uh, amorphous alumina. But if we introduce uh, powder to this uh, solution and we can have this um, amorphous alumina coated on the uh, powder particles, right? And that's what we did. And we, we used uh, two kinds of powders, uh, 10 micron and uh, 70 micron. And you can see the morphology of the raw powder and the coated powder uh, for the two different cases. And you can see after coating, we have these uh, uh, tiny white particles on top of the original uh, particles. Uh, because of the tiny size and also the amorphous phase, and they have a very high activity, right? So they, they can be sintered easily. And with that, we can uh, improve the sinterability, right? So that's our uh, hypothesis. And the figure on the bottom row, right, shows our results, right? After pressing and sintering, you can see the coating uh, turns into a network uh, connecting the original particles, right? In this uh, uh, second figure and also the fourth figure, the last figure. And if you, you don't have any coating, if you have only the 10 micron powder and the 70 micron powder, uh, although you do the you do sintering, so-called sintering, right? So at a high temperature, but you, do, you don't get, um, much necking, right? So it still uh, keep the original kind of granular shape, right? So it's kind of like a loose particle still, right? So uh, that's why uh, we introduced this uh, coating with, to improve uh, the sinterability. And uh, we also uh, test the uh, strength and the shrinkage of the parts of the simple samples. And uh, you can see the uh, compressive strength was improved a lot, right? So this is for 10 micron and this is for 70 micron, right? So 10 micron, the, the, the absolute strength is higher than 70 micron because it itself has a, a smaller particle size and therefore a higher sinterability to start with. And the 70 micron doesn't have a very high sinterability to start with so that you, have, you can have a large enhancement here. And uh, if we look at the uh, shrinkage, we can tell the same story, right? So the coated powder has a much larger shrinkage than the raw powder. So here shrinkage is a good thing, right? Because we are trying to improve the uh, sinterability, right? If you don't have a shrinkage, 
you cannot consolidate it, right? You cannot really eliminate the pores uh, in the loose powder. So we favor shrinkage here. So shrinkage is a good indication of uh, uh, improved uh, sinterability. So, so far the two, uh, the first uh, two uh, methods are based on uh, micro powders, right? So uh, the first one really mixed uh, different size, the micro powders and the second one uh, do a coating on the micro powders. And one can naturally ask why uh, no, micro powder, why not uh, nano powder, right? Nano powder has a uh, good uh, sinterability, right? Because uh, of their uh, small size. Uh, the problem of uh, nano powder is that it has a very poor uh, flow ability, right? So you can uh, you can form some kind of uh, large uh, cavities in the uh, powder bed. So uh, the third approach here is to uh, introduce uh, this uh, granulation method to improve the flow ability. And the granulation works uh, like this. So we have, uh, for example, nanoscale particles to start with, and we somehow assemble them uh, into micro scale uh, granules. And there are many granulation techniques and later on I will introduce ours. Uh, after doing this uh, granulation, uh, you can uh, have this uh, original nanoparticles, which can ensure a high sinterability. And this uh, microgranule, because of the larger mass, you can uh, have a good uh, flow ability. Right? So in this case, after granulation, you have both uh, powder uh, metrics uh, ensured, right? So uh, sometimes uh, for when we do granulation, we can introduce some binders. And recently we found a binder sometimes is uh, not uh, necessary, right? So those uh, uh, blue lines, uh, blue curves here uh, really uh, represent some polymer uh, binders. Uh, the granulation method we chose is called a spray freeze drying, right? It's different from the traditional um, spray drying so for uh, because uh, this uh, spray freeze drying can offer us uh, uh, a better structure uh, because the spray drying can introduce some hollow structure into the uh, granules. And the spray freeze drying works like this. It's a two-step process, uh, spray freezing and the freeze drying, right? In spray freezing, uh, we first make a slurry, basically mix the uh, dry powder uh, with a solution, uh, you, usually we just use water. And uh, you can also add some uh, uh, dispersant uh, if the powder are not uh, easily uh, mixed. Uh, and then after making this uh, slurry, you use a pump uh, to uh, transfer the slurry into this nozzle. And the nozzle can spray uh, the slurry into a droplet. And the droplets are sprayed into this liquid nitrogen, right, with a very low temperature, and uh, all the droplets got frozen immediately. And we get this uh, frozen droplet uh, with uh, ice as the matrix and with a lot of uh, dispersed uh, uh, particles uh, in it. Uh, and after that, we can do uh, freeze drying. And freeze drying basically is a process uh, uh, where water becomes vapor without going through the liquid uh, phase. Um, so after freeze drying, we can achieve this uh, dry granule without any uh, water molecules, right? So not ice, not uh, vapor, right? So just a dry uh, granule. And we use that as our uh, feedstock material. And here is the experimental result about the powder uh, we have achieved. And uh, you can see the top row are the raw nano powder. And you can see they have a very small size if you look at the uh, high magnification, but we do have a few uh, like agglomerations, uh, right? So it's not a single, uh, uh, single nano uh, particles, it's uh, natural agglomerates. But after granulation, we can see uh, all of these uh, spherical uh, granules they are uh, almost perfectly spherical and has a smooth surface. And we can expect a high flowability uh, in this uh, powder. And uh, here are the results about uh, uh, powder flowability. So we test uh, many metrics uh, 
about the powder flow ability. And here is one of the example, the repulse angle, right? So the repulse angle of the raw uh, nanopowder uh, is very high, which means that they don't flow very well, right? And uh, in the second case, uh, the granulated powder, you can see a very low uh, repulse angle, which means the flow ability is very good. And then we can also see the same uh, results from the powder bed surface. Uh, the powder bed surface from the raw nano powder is very rough, while the surface from the granulated powder is uh, very uh, smooth. And here is a, a summary of uh, uh, different densities uh, we measured. Uh, we measured the parent density and tap density of the powder. Uh, we also measured the powder bed density achieved by these uh, two powders, and then also the printed and sintered bulk density. Right? And you can see that uh, from all of these uh, metrics, the, the granulated powder outperforms the uh, raw powder here. Right? So that's the uh, all the density uh, metrics, and the, which means that this uh, granulation is an effective method to uh, improve uh, density. And uh, here are the uh, experimental results on the microstructure. Uh, you can see from this uh, uh, the microstructure of the raw nano powder, we have a lot of large uh, random pores. If you look at the scale bar, the, the pores are larger than uh, two hundred. Uh, microns. And uh, although uh, in some uh, area we, we, we have the skeleton, uh, we have a kind of a dense structure. But uh, in the part printed with the granulated powder, we can see this kind of like a regular porous structure. Right? So all the uh, granules are connected to each other, right? So you can see a good necking because we have uh, the nanoparticles to start with. And if you look at the surface of each uh, uh, granule, and they are all uh, densely uh, sintered. But we do have this problem, right? We have a lot of uh, uh, intergranular uh, pores, right? That's why we couldn't achieve a very high density. And uh, that's what uh, we are working on. And that also that's why uh, we start, started on the next uh, method, which is the uh, nano powder assisted by uh, powder bed compaction. So, Again, right, so the, we said this uh, nano powder uh, has a, a poor flow ability. And uh, so, because of the poor flow ability, we can only achieve a low uh, powder bed density, right? So, for this, uh, with this uh, uh, nano powder, you can, you can expect a lot of cavities uh, in it. And uh, but uh, with uh, powder bed compaction, we hope it can improve the powder bed density. And the uh, powder bed compaction uh, has been uh, studied uh, in the literature, but it was not uh, uh, really available on a lot of printers. And uh, but the Innovent Plus we just acquired from X1 uh, has this feature, right? So so it works uh, like this. Uh, so you always start with uh, lowering the polar bed, and then. Uh, in this case, when we apply powder bed compaction, uh, we uh, lower the powder bed by the layer thickness plus the uh, compaction thickness, right? So this is different. Like traditionally, you only lower the, your powder bed by uh, the layer thickness, and then you fill the powder, and then you start printing, right? In this case, we lower it uh, by uh, extra uh, height, which, is, which we call the compaction thickness, right? And then we uh, uh, dispense the powder uh, from this uh, hopper, and uh, we use a counter-rotating roller. So counter-rotating ro roller is very good at spreading, right? make a smooth surface, uh, uh, because it cannot really shuffle all up uh, the particles and left it behind. Right? So uh, we use a counter-rotating to make a smooth uh, surface first, and then uh, you raise the powder bed by the compaction thickness, and then you use a forward rotating roller to compact it. A forward rotating roller is kind of like a, how you do uh, like a pavement uh, of the road, right? So you can really compact it, right? So the rotating direction uh, is uh, different uh, from the counter rotating roller, right? 
And in this case, uh, hopefully we can uh, kind of squeeze all the actual uh, powder into the uh, into the powder bag, right? And that in that case, we can uh, achieve a higher uh, powder bag density. And uh, here is a simplified uh, illustration uh, in the machine. Actually, it's going back and forth a couple of times. Uh, depends on how you choose your parameter. At least uh, you have to do it uh, back and forth by one time. For example, uh, the compaction thickness is divided by two, and you finish it in two uh, uh, pass segments. And uh, you can also do more, right? So, so to kind of to ease out the process, the compaction process. To each time you don't compact a lot, so you can increase your compaction uh, efficiency that way. So this is the uh, how the powder bed compaction work. And uh, we use this one, uh, this feature on uh, our in our recent research uh, with the uh, with the nano powder, right? So uh, you can see we did uh, two kinds of uh, layer thicknesses, uh, 30 micron and also five micron. And uh, so all of them are very small layer thicknesses uh, because we were using a uh, nano powder, we were able to use a small layer thickness. And uh, the compaction thickness for the 30 micron layer thickness was uh, zero, basically no compaction and uh, 200, right? You can see a very aggressive uh, uh, compaction here, right? So a very large ratio uh, between the compaction thickness to the layer thickness. And uh, so if we don't use uh, any uh, compaction and the powder bag density was only uh, eight, around eight, right? So it's very low packing density, right? So uh, in micro powder, we can achieve a 50%, uh, even more 60% uh, packing density, but for nano powder is very hard, it's very fluffy. So you can know that if you buy powder, right? So you, if you buy the same mass of the powder, same weight of powder, you can uh, expect a very large bucket if you buy the nano powder than the, uh, compared with the uh, micro powder. So the powder bed density here uh, is very low, only 8%. And after applying this uh, compaction thickness of 200, uh, we were able to achieve uh, more than 10% uh, powder bed density, right? And also if we uh, use a smaller layer thickness and you can see uh, also uh, increase, increase uh, in the powder bed density, right? So from uh, uh, like 10% uh, uh, to about 12%. And that's already a large improvement. And uh, this is also uh, evidenced by the uh, printed center density in the, on this page, right? So you can see that if we don't apply compaction, we can only achieve a density around 50%, uh, right? So after printing and sintering. And uh, uh, after uh, applying compaction, right? So with uh, the comp the layer thickness of 30, we can uh, have this uh, uh, print and center density uh, to reach uh, more than 60%. And the highest uh, uh, density we achieved was uh, with the layer thickness of five and the compaction thickness of uh, uh, 60, right? So uh, this uh, uh, density, is 72% uh, and we compared uh, this value with other uh, uh, data in the literature, right? So we only look at the alumina uh, samples and uh, with different feedstock powders, nano powder, granulated powder, micro powder, and the micro powder mixtures. And uh, we don't, uh, we didn't include any work involving some uh, kind of unusual uh, wet feedstock or some special uh, post-processing technique, for example, pressing and uh, uh, infiltration, right? So we didn't include them to make a fair uh, comparison. Uh, so if we uh, accept those uh, conditions, uh, we, we can tell that uh, this study achieved the highest uh, density in the literature is 72% uh, with this uh, uh, nano uh, powder. So although it's a big, like, uh, I mean, big uh, enhancement, and uh, we, I think it's still uh, not uh, uh, like uh, fully dense yet, and we are still uh, working on it. And also, we are trying to figure out figure out uh, where the particle, where the powder go, right? So we applied very aggressive uh, compaction, and we wonder uh, why the powder cannot uh, uh, get uh, kind of captured by the roller and into the uh, powder bed. 
And here are the uh, uh, experimental results for the uh, microstructure. And you can see now we don't see very uh, uh, clear or very obvious uh, pores, very large pores. And uh, in this uh, uh, low magnification image and in the high magnification image, we can see some uh, uh, fully centered region, right? So very high uh, density region. And this is the best sample we achieved with this pure uh, alumina sample. All right, so to make a summary, uh, so we developed those uh, four approaches. Uh, first, uh, we use this uh, uh, multi-model powder really to increase the powder bed density of a micro powder, right? So this method was focused on uh, micro powder. And in that way, we were able to achieve uh, a higher center density. And uh, secondly, we developed this uh, coated powder and uh, we were able uh, to increase the centerability of micro powder. And then we increased the centered uh, strength. Uh, uh, thirdly, we have this uh, granulated powder. We were able to achieve a higher flowability uh, for nano powder, and then we achieve a higher centered density. And uh, lastly, uh, is our unpublished uh, uh, recent work. And we use uh, nano powder and we apply powder bed compaction we were able to uh, increase the powder bed density and therefore the center density. We believe this is the highest in the literature so far. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to uh, present, how I prepared. And I, uh, I think, I hope this is just a starting point for our further discussion and the future collaborations. And as I mentioned that we do have a few students uh, who are graduating, if you are looking for new employees, let us know. And also, if you want to uh, collaborate on this topic, and uh, we are open for collaborations. Thank you, real time. All right, thank oh. you, Chow. Great, great presentation. Uh, we'll now head into the Q&A session. Uh, if you have a question for the presenter and you haven't done so, uh, please type it into the chat box. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions here that came in. Uh, first question was, how did you calculate the packing density in the powder bed? Uh, so I guess uh, this question is about the packing density we did uh, in the uh, multi-model powder. And uh, in the multi-model powder, we use uh, this uh, linear uh, packing model. We can calculate the density of a fully packed powder, right? So it's only for fully packed powder. So that's why we use uh, the tap density uh, to compare it. We were not able to calculate the powder bed density using this model. And uh, you can see also the powder bed density measured is, is uh, not close to the calculated uh, fully packed density, but it is uh, kind of like an indication. So you can see this uh, kind of correlation between uh, the tap density and the model, the fully packed density and the powder bed density and center density. So this is uh, more like a correlation instead of a direct prediction or a calculation. Good question. All right, thank you. All right, let's see. Thank you. I have another question that just came in here. Okay, he said, great work and presentation, thanks. Uh, how do different powder feeds affect the accuracy of printed parts? Shrinkage, shrinkage has been a has been the big issue in binder jetting. Do you have any progress to address this? Thank you for your question. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, good question. Uh, so far, we haven't done a lot of work on like uh, mitigating the shrinkage and uh, like really uh, improving the printing uh, accuracy uh, because uh, we, we, we were focusing on this uh, uh, density issue because it's really affect the performance of the material, right? So we don't want the part fail. I think our next step is to uh, study really the printing accuracy and also address the shrinkage issue. You can see actually here, we kind of like shrinkage to increase uh, density, but uh, uh, I think uh, in the future, we want to uh, evaluate uh, how shrinkage affect density, maybe come up with some models uh, to uh, compensate shrinkage. Thank you for your question. Okay, great. Ah, I got another one that came in here. All right. Once again, great presentation. 
Uh, without being an expert on ceramics, is porosity a significant barrier in the more mainstream stream adoption of ceramics AM? What are the production implications of this research? Yes, I yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think it also has a lot of industrial uh, yeah, implications. Uh, so far, the, the, the presentation I presented, uh, uh, how addressing the density or porosity issues, because we believe it's a fundamental issue. Uh, but uh, we, we are also uh, uh, aware some applications uh, for ceramic material do not require a fully dense uh, material. So they can uh, actually, this kind of porous ceramic uh, can also find the uh, industrial applications. And uh, I think uh, we don't have to uh, like fully solve the uh, shrink, I mean, the, the porosity issue to find industrial applications. And, but I think using this method here, right, the four method here, we can uh, tune uh, the porosity and density uh, to um, have uh, uh, more interesting like uh, application, I would say. But I think for some uh, applications like load bearing applications, we do require a very strong part. And for those, uh, porosity is a big deal. And that's why uh, we work on this uh, uh, in this area to try to uh, really think about ways to improve density. All right, thank you for that. Um, let's see one more here. Is anyone commercially using ceramic AM that you are aware of? Uh, I, I know some companies are uh, working uh, on ceramic uh, as uh, commercial uh, applications. For example, I think a dental is a, a good application area now, right? So people can uh, print a small parts and uh, like crown and they can uh, use that uh, directly, right? So from uh, AM uh, parts, I think that's a, a good application. And also, uh, if you are looking for uh, some uh, like uh, like a porous structure, I know people use uh, ceramics to make uh, some uh, catalyst. All right, thank you very much. Let's see. Thank you. All right, I think that's uh, that's all the questions. So um, I guess that'll wrap up today's TRX webinar. I would love to once again thank Chow. Uh, if you have further questions for him, please reach out to him directly at, do you wanna go ahead and, and uh, bring up that last slide so they can get the email address for you? Sure. So, so like Chow, you're interested in collaboration or? Yeah, uh, so if you have any yeah, further questions and feel free to yeah, reach out to us. So this, uh, this is my uh, email, cma at uh, tamu.edu. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there will be a post webinar survey going out to all of those who participated. Uh, we do really appreciate the time that you take to provide American Makes feedback so that we may continue to improve and strengthen the additive community. And as a reminder that if you think your organization will be interested in sharing on the TRX webinar series, please fill out the form that follows the presentation or you can reach out to myself, uh, Jason Thomas at jason.thomas at ncdmm.org. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you all for your attendance.